Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. I'm going to read from verse 24, verse 27. I felt to read this today before we began, because we have two messages, but are really one in their content and their meaning for us. So Matthew chapter 16, verse 24 through to 27. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what man, what is man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. May God bless his word. Amen. Amen. So let's keep that at the back of our minds while we go through the two messages today. The theme, I don't know whether you've seen from the uh, messages that Sally sent around, the theme for my message, I'll say message because there are two, but it's one whole. The message really is, for whom do you build? For whom do you build? And I chose that really because we're all involved, aren't we? We're all involved with Christ Jesus in his church. We're all living stones, Peter tells us. Living stones being knit together. And we are co-workers with Christ. We are yoked together with him, aren't we? Take my yoke upon you, Jesus said. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So if you're feeling downcast and heavy today, you've got the wrong yoke. Amen. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, and we're going to start the first message, which I've called, Compared to the Pattern. Compared to the Pattern. Turn with me, if you will, to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25, and I'm going to read from verse 1 through to verse 9. Exodus 25, verse 1. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, you shall take my offering. And this is the offering which you shall take of them, gold and silver and brass and blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen and goat's hair and ram skins dyed red and badger skins and shittim wood or acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for anointing oil and for sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them. Hallelujah. According to all that I show thee, after the pattern of the tabernacle, and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. Now before we begin proper in this teaching, I want to let you know that there's going to be a lot of scripture today. Everybody said, yay! (laughs) There's going to be a lot of scripture, so if you want to write them down, be swift at hand. Or see me afterwards. Now before we begin, let me ask you a question. Is the church, the body of Christ, a good and effective witness in the world today. 
Talking now in general, not specifically of this precious place. Does it reflect rightly the words of Jesus in the following scripture? And if you want to turn with me, it's Matthew 5, verse 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savour, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And it gives light unto what? Sorry, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand or candlestick. And it gives light to all that are in the house. That's you. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Now I ask you again, does the church rightly reflect these words of Jesus today? Now if as I gather your answer might be no, yes. then the obvious question is, why not? Why not? Through the ages, especially after two world wars, the church, the church more specifically for us, the church in the West, really lost its way, didn't it? Would you agree the church has lost its way? Yes. It really had no effective answers to the popular social move, which began in the 50s and sparked off the so-called swinging 60s and all things that followed it. At least it had no answers that would count in any meaningful and lasting way. The growing pop culture that developed in, in America with its the rock and roll and, and in the UK seeing the rise of the Beatles and the Stones and everything that followed it brought with it probably inevitably a push amongst the young people at that time for more freedom from the seemingly, and I say seemingly, restrictive lifestyles of their parents. Now this led to a more liberal way of life, as we know, bringing with it so-called free love, the movement of the hippies. Anybody remember the hippies? Yes. Lots of you aren't old enough to know. Yes. Remember the hippies. I remember the days of the hippies. Praise God. I'm not alone. The so-called sexual revolution. Boy, what a mess that turned out to be. And it came to be known as the sexual revolution. And a more inclusive society formed as a result. And a terrible consequence of these things were such as legalised abortion. And the state that we have today of LGBT and all allied things. And we cut even to a point today where even in the church Many live in fear of radical Islam. Why? When we serve a mighty God, should we be afraid of anyone? But many in the church live in fear. And this has really brought us to where we are today. Where liberalism, polit political correctness, I have a job to get my teeth right now. Political correctness, they seem to rule everything, don't they, in our lives. What we see, what we hear, what we do, where we go. And a generation has now appeared which in the main are looked upon and called snowflakes. What a terrible indictment of a generation to be called snowflakes, weaklings, shaken by every 
slight thing that happens. They have to hide into the shadows and look in the universities. They're even calling for safe spaces in universities. What craziness. And it's a situation where children as young as, so I've heard, seven and eight, maybe younger now, are now questioning their gender. When we're preaching the word of God in the street can see you in prison, but where even partial birth abortion is allowed. By partial birth abortion, I mean full term babies being aborted. This is happening. It happens, sadly, in Israel. The land, the birth, our Lord Jesus Christ. But this is the world that we live in. And the focus of many fellowships, I say again, not this one, the focus of many fellowships is on the building, not on the people within it. We then, as the ch- where then has the church gone wrong? More importantly though, how can it be restored, revived, before the return of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ? Because, being no mistake, He is coming. He is coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Where's the church gone wrong? How can it be restored before the Lord Lord returns? Well, this is what we're going to look at in this first message. I haven't even begun the message yet. But that's what we're going to look at in this first message. So, let's begin. Is everyone comfortable? Yes. So let's begin. (laughs) Those of you old enough will understand that. There's nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. Turn with me to Ecclesiastes, chapter 1. Ecclesiastes, chapter 1. I'm going to read the first 11 verses. (laughs) Wait for everyone to get there. Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, verse 1. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is but vanity. What profiteth a man of all his labour, which he taketh under the sun? One generation passeth away, and another generation cometh. But the earth abides for ever. The sun also arises, and the sun goes down, and hasteneth to its place where he arose. The wind goeth towards the south, and turneth about to the north. He whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again, according to his circuits. All the rivers run into the sea, and yet the sea is not full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, there they return again. All things are full of labour. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. I want you to underline that. There is no new thing under the sun. Remember that verse. Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new. It hath already been of all time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come, with those that shall come after. Solomon was a wise man, the wisest of all men, The book of Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon. He was a man blessed by Almighty God with wisdom above any other human being in history. 
he made a study of all the thoughts and works of mankind. He made a study of them. He made it his life's work. And what he learned from all his study was concluded in these words. All is but vanity. All is but vanity. How's that for a conclusion? Where do you think you get if you use that <coughs> for an exam question in school today? All is but vanity. <laughs> it wouldn't get you very far, would it? But this is the conclusion that Solomon came to after all his studies on the thoughts, intents and works of man. Fallen man. But what though does vanity really mean? Does anybody know what vanity means? It's a word not really used today, isn't it? It means empty, isn't it? The word um, translated for us as vanity in the King James, I, I guess you use another version here, it doesn't really matter. It's from the Hebrew word hebel, hebel, H-E-B-E-L. And the word has the following meaning in the Hebrew dictionary. Emptiness. Something unsatisfactory. A vapour. A breath. It's empty. Vacuous. You could go on with the words. King Solomon, in all his extensive, extensive studies of human thought and deed, came to the understanding that everything in this life to be either done or thought was empty, vacuous, vain, without God. Without God. He summed up all of his vast study up in the final words of his book. Turn with me if you want to Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes 12. 13 and 14. Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. Underline His. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Sadly though, even after what this, the wisest man who ever lived, had written, the nation that under his father King David had been united as one became split into two, divided, fell into all kinds of abominations and sins and came under the judgment of God. Both sections, the northern section, Israel, the ten tribes, were taken into captivity, into Assyria in 721 BC. And then Judah, made up of Judah and Benjamin, were taken into captivity into Babylon in 586. What a terrible come down for the nation and the people of God. All because they did not fear God and keep his commandments. Now this would begin their long period of humiliation. Talking about Israel now as a whole. Humiliation. At the hands of successive rulers. And this sad history of God's people is or rather should be a stark reminder to us, the children of God, in this age. We are the people of God, aren't we? So this word 
to Israel means just as much to us as it did to them. God never changes. His word never changes. Amen. Amen. But it should show us what happens when obedience is replaced by rebellion to the ways of God and the things of God. Or should I say, doing what is right in our own eyes instead of doing what's right according to God's word. And if you want a a link for that quotation, it's from Judges 17.6. It's the people of Israel did what was right in their own eyes and they paid the price. However, as we'll see, lessons would not be learned and sadly the church was to lapse into many of the same errors that Israel did in their day. Remember, there's nothing new under the sun. What has been, will be again. They didn't learn the lessons and sadly the church was to lapse into those same, many of the same errors as Israel and Judah. Errors which could so easily have been avoided through good teaching and listening ears and obedient hearts of God's people. And the reason is, I believe, I put it to you, that because we are part of this sick church, we are part of this sick church, even though we individually may be faithful in our walk, we are still part of the whole. We follow not the king, but we do what is right in our own eyes. Many times, I hold up my hand. At times, I do my own thing. And I'm sure you do too. But how does such a thing happen? It begins first in comfort. This is my next section. The problem, problems in the church, specifically, as I say, in the church in the West, that's all I can speak about. I'm part of the church in the West. So are you. I can't speak of China or Philippines or Japan or elsewhere. I speak of here, in the West. The problem is that the church, specifically in the West, sprang from a sense of comfort and ease. The problems sprang from a sense of comfort and ease. And I'll go more into the reasons for that in a minute. But it happened just the same as it did to Israel and to Judah. Jeremiah, that wonderful prophet of God, came to bring the word of God to a prosperous Judah. As they thought. Things were great for them. But God, through his prophet, was telling them that if you don't change your ways, you're going to come under judgment. (coughs) Judgment is coming. So get yourself right. And of course, they didn't listen. And so it is, has been, rather, with much of the church in the West. It's done its own thing. (coughs) It hasn't feared God and obeyed his commandments. His word that never changes. So it begins in comfort. A growing sense of prosperity and freedom that developed after the war years. Now I wasn't alive during the war years. I might look as if I was. (laughs) But I wasn't just. But I know there may be some here who were alive during the war years. They were hard years, weren't they? Those of you who were here, they were hard years. And after those war years, after rationing had finished, the nation began to rebuild. Things began to look better. Things became more freely available 
And as I said before, all the things from from America, rock and roll, and you know what, everything else came with it. And because of that sense of prosperity and freedom, growing prosperity and freedom, was seen by many to mean God's blessing on the nation and his favour upon the nation. And it may have been at the time. Because during those war years, especially the, the Second World War, specifically towards the end, in those dark days, when the king called the nation to prayer, if God hadn't stepped in, we'd be living in a different world today. We'd be living in a different world. But the king called the nation to prayer, and God heard. Praise God. Hallelujah. However, a new generation was beginning to emerge after the war years. A generation that knew nothing of the attrition of those war years. Knew nothing of the fear and anxiety that was in the nation during those war years. And the urgent call upon God for help through the war years. Many, especially men, fathers, there were some women obviously who, who served as well, many women who served, who experienced the horrors of the two world wars could not or would not share those horrors with their children and grandchildren. For good reason. But, therefore, a generation will grow up only knowing peace, only knowing relative prosperity. A generation who, in the main, with some exceptions, don't throw things at me, but there will be many who will be spoiled by their parents in those years following the war. They didn't want the children to suffer the way they'd suffered. They wanted them to have things. They wanted their children to go to college, to go to university, to get a better job, to go on in life, to achieve things. And that's not a bad thing, is it? But many parents would give in to children's wants and desires. And this is sadly what happened to the generation who inherited the promised land. Turn with me to Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 6 down to verse 15. Judges chapter 2 and verse 6. <coughs> And when Joshua had let the people go, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the excuse me, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance, in Timnathus, in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of the hill Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord. Underline that. There arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baalim. And the land of... Um, I'm sorry. And they forsook the Lord, the God of the fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods. The gods of the people that were round about them 
and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered them into the hand of the spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Things were going great while Joshua and these elders were alive. But something went wrong after Joshua died and after all the elders died. What does it say? A generation arose who knew not the Lord. All the great things that he had done. How could that happen? The generation who crossed the River Jordan and had taken the land from the nations that were living there had not instilled into their children the law of Moses. Nor the importance of obedience to and trusting the Lord God. The Lord God Almighty. Yahweh. Isn't that sad? So soon, just one generation after Joshua, there was no knowledge of the Lord. And much of the same has happened to the church. After the war years, through first of all, comfort and plenty and liberty in many areas. So, we now see a generation who as a result of being spoiled with the fat of the land, of prosperity, freedom, liberty and everything else. They knew not the ways of God but sought only what was pleasing to them and what, them made, what made them happy or excited. Does that sound familiar? They did the things that made them happy. And you could sum up most, I would say most, of what is called the evangelical church today with those words. They do what makes them happy. Brothers and sisters, that's not Christianity. That's humanism. Humanist, humanism is centred on the happiness of man. Christianity is supposed to be based in the glory of God. We live to worship him. Not us. But look around you. Look around you at, at the many churches in your own areas that have gone this way. <coughs> they got go into the likes of the music of Hillsong and the worship types with smoke and discotheque music. That's not glory in God. It's glorifying man. Such it was in Israel when the elders died and Joshua died. The generation grew up not knowing the Lord nor the great and mighty things that he had done. And so it is with the church today. We have a generation that knows not the Lord. They know about him, but they don't know him. They don't have a relationship with him. They've never been changed. They've never been challenged. They've never been convicted of sin. And be brought to the knees with that conviction to repent and turn from the wicked ways and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ who came to make a way for us from that sin. <coughs> Does any of this sound familiar? In your own time maybe you could read Proverbs 30 verses 
7 to 9. And also Philippians chapter 4 verses 11 to 13. Proverbs 30 verses 7 to 9. And Philippians chapter 4 verses 11 to 13. Now going back a little way. <clears throat> I personally was born in 1954. I know I don't look like it. I know I looked like I was born in the 70s or something. <laughs> no, I was born in 1954. And in July, on July 4th of that year, the rationing of meat was finally lifted by the government. That was the last thing being rationed. The rationing of meat. And it was lifted on the 4th of July, 1954. Now this act by the British government made Britain free from rationing. Praise God. And that was, if you like, the last remnant of the attrition of the war years. So anyone born at this time in 1954 or after that time grew up not knowing about those things. Through the 50s and 60s Western nations began to rebuild and to reinvest in industry and, and things like this and, and to flourish once again. Life became better for some. And as I said before, a generation grew up not knowing about the hardships of those years. They wanted to express themselves and to throw off the seeming Restrictions, the sternness and the stiffness of the ways of life of their parents. I know because I was one of them. As I said, I was born in 1954. So I grew up in those late 50s, early 60s. I know what it was like in those days. There was a rebellion against the strictness of, of church or, or whatever. We wanted freedom. We wanted to do our own thing. Anybody else? Yes. Mm. Praise God. <laughs> nice to know I'm not the only one. <laughs> they wanted to express themselves and throw off that seemingly stern and stiff way of life as they perceived it, as we perceived it. In the churches, the young began to want more lively worship. Isn't that true? They wanted more lively music. They wanted music which more echoed the pop music of the time that they could dance along to, wave around and clap their hands. And many church leaders gave in because they were afraid that people would leave the church. So they bowed to it and it came in, not wanting to lose families in the congregation. And this will prove to be the thin end of the wedge for many churches. <coughs> As pastors and leaders of that great period of the pre-war and war years died out or retired who had a real relationship with God. I know many who were great pastors. They knew the word and they knew the God of the word. They spent hours in prayer on their knees before God, before bringing a sermon, before studying the word. Even. And they knew when they were spoken to by the Lord. But a generation grew up that didn't have that relationship. Because that teaching, that understanding was never passed on. In the main. Don't get me wrong, there were some who remained faithful to the word, to prayer, to Bible study, to evangelism. Many didn't. And so these generations appeared and grew up not knowing the God of the word. They didn't have a real life-changing relationship with Almighty God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ.
they were replaced, these pastors who either died or uh, retired with much younger and more ambitious ones. And these would have plans for, amongst other things, bigger and bolder churches. <coughs> bigger projects. Rightly or wrongly. For outreach. To reach out to the area that they were based in. However, these churches would not see the preaching. In the main, I'm saying now, they would not see the preaching of the full gospel message. They would not be taught that we are to obey an awesome God. They'd not be taught that we need to read this. Because this is our life manual. How many here have bought a new car in the last few years? Or in their life? Or any car? <laughs> we got there eventually. But those cars, if they'd been looked after, came with a workshop manual or a, a handbook yes. to tell you how the car worked, didn't it? Yes. My yeah? car is mine. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. My father had one, so I know they're good. But that, that handbook or that owner's manual told you the important things about the car. How to keep it running efficiently. How to look after it. Look, checking the tyres and the water and the oil and things like this. Cleaning the spark plugs. I'm used to have spark plugs. <laughs> but this, brothers and sisters, is our life manual. Yes. Yes. Scripture tells us that the word of God is food for our soul. So if we don't eat it regularly, if we don't come around it regularly and study it, digest it, our soul is going to suffer, isn't it? But there are many churches today that don't even use Bibles. Some of you may have been to churches where people don't even carry a Bible. I was taught when I first came to the Lord, carry the word of God with you everywhere you go. If you need one for your pocket, buy a smaller one. But you never know when you will need it and how true that is. But how many carry the word today? How many read it? How many study it? How many churches have Bible studies? And if they do have Bible studies, how many attend them? Do you know, when I was first saved, back in 1984, the church that I was attending when I got saved, the Bible study meeting and the prayer meeting were the two most populated meetings in that church. And praise God for it. But how many churches can you say that of today? This is the problem, saints. As the pastors and leaders died or retired, who had a real relationship with God, who knew the Word, whose lives had been changed, crushed and rebuilt by the loving hands of the Lord Jesus. Others would come in, Younger, more ambitious, with other ideas. However, these churches would not see the preaching of the full gospel message. They would not have Bible studies. They wouldn't have prayer meetings. Instead, as some in my own area, they'll have ice cream days. Seriously. coffee church come and have a meal while we have worship and preach the word I'm not here to judge brothers and sisters but something is wrong something is seriously wrong and sadly we have a church in the main today which seeks preaches a social gospel one which tickles the ears and makes people feel happier, more content and safe. 
from the well. But, as I said earlier, that's not the scriptural definition of Christianity. Christianity is the glory of God. The obedience of God. Walking the straight and narrow path, isn't it? Do you know what? I often preach from the, uh, the paragraph that Jesus used about the straight and narrow gate and the straight and narrow way. Many people will teach on the straight gate, the narrow gate. Remember Pilgrim's Progress? Yes. That narrow gate. How many of them, I wonder, ever preach that there is a straight and narrow way after the gate? A narrow way that we are to keep to. Just as Pilgrim did on his journey. Our way is straight and narrow. And as we said in the, in the prayer before the meeting, God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. And we need that light to see our way on the straight and narrow way. Because there are many dangers on either side. As pop culture exploded around the world, so the new pop culture grew in the church. And as a result, there were many false revivals. There have been great revivals in the church. The Welsh revival, <coughs> the uh, Hebrides revival, and so on. But there have been many false ones too. Remember Toronto? Yes, that was false. And so many others that I'm not going to go into here because it's unworthy of the time before the Lord. But whilst many churches are singing and dancing and rolling about on the floor, singing to the latest choruses, abortion was being legalised. <laughs> Same-sex marriage has been legalised. These things should never have happened, brothers and sisters, if we were salt and light. A generation who had not been schooled in, in the word of God was now in rebellion and set on a course of self-destruction. Many churches have closed because people have gone elsewhere to better music, better worship, they have more smoke in their meetings or something. They've forgotten the fact that they are in the world but not of it. We are to be in this world but not of it. We are other. Doesn't it say to him who is in Christ Jesus he is a new creation? Yes. Look at the Greek word when it it's been translated creation. It means a new created thing. A new species. You are a new species. Amen. You are not of this world. You're born of God. <coughs> Praise God for it. Amen. Generation, again, had been schooled, not been schooled in the word of God, was now in rebellion and set on its own course of self-destruction. They'd forgotten the fact that they're in this world, but not of it. As we see in the following Scriptures. Turn with me to John 17, if you will. John 17, starting at verse 11. John 17, Jesus' priestly prayer. John 17, verse 11 to verse 17. <coughs> John 17, verse 11. And now I am no more in the world but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, and by saying that, that doesn't mean the Pope. <laughs> he's not holy and he's not my Father. <laughs> Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in my name. 
Those that thou hast given me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have joy, my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath not hated them, because they are, sorry, the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I, I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but thou should keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Say with me together, Thy word is truth. Hallelujah. Jesus' final priestly prayer to his heavenly Father, asking him to strengthen and to keep his chosen ones. You and I, you and I, are kept by the Lord if we keep close to him. Strengthening his chosen ones as he's preparing to go to the Father and prepare a place for you and for me. Didn't he say that if I go I will prepare a place for you? Yes. He has a place for you. And you know what? There'll be no mortgage. <laughs> There'll be no rent to pay. There'll be no terrible landlord. No noisy neighbours. Well, there might be my noisy neighbours because they'll be rejoicing in heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, that's a good kind of noisy, isn't it? It's a good kind of noisy neighbour. But you know, just as Joshua had tried to instil to his people the importance of being different, Israel was to be different. They were to be the light of the world. A light unto the Gentiles. You and I. They were meant to be different from the nations that surrounded them. And in his, he said this in his final speech in Joshua 24. Read with me. I didn't write this down, but turn with me if you will to Joshua 24. I'm going to read the whole thing. I told you there'd be a lot of scripture. Joshua chapter 24, verse 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood, and led him through all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his seed, and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob, and Esau, and I gave unto Esau Mansia to possess him. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses, also Aaron, and I plagued Israel. Uh, sorry, plagued Israel. Egypt. Egypt. Sorry. Get my teeth around that. Plagued Egypt. He didn't plague Israel until later. According to that which I had done among them, and afterward I brought you out, and I brought your fathers out of Egypt and you came unto the sea the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea and when they cried unto the Lord 
He put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your, heart, your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt and you dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites which dwelt on the other side of Jordan. And they fought with you and I gave them into your hand that you might possess their land. And I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore he blessed you still. So I delivered you out of his hand. And you went over Jordan and came to Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. And the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and all the other others. <laughs> and I delivered them into your hand. And I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword, nor with thy bow. And I have given you a land for which you did not labour, and cities which you built not, and you dwelt in them, of the vineyards and olive yards which you planted, not do you eat. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. I'll stop there, that's enough. Joshua himself passed on that knowledge to the people. But sadly after that he wasn't passed on to the next generation, as we saw. But they did rebel. And so have we. In the main. I'm not talking about you individually. But in the church in general as the body of Christ in the West. But with rebellion comes judgment. Whenever the people of God drifted into blatant disobedience and wicked behaviour, <coughs> judgment of God was sure to come, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yes. You can see this fact throughout Scripture. After the rebellion which arose after the death of Joshua, <coughs> God had to raise up judges to judge Israel because they rebelled and went into wickedness. After the judges, when they passed away, God raised up kings to judge and to lead Israel. That didn't go very well. When the kings failed, captivity in a foreign and pagan land came as a result. That was the ultimate judgment that God could give upon his people. To take them out of the land that he had taken them into. What a terrible thing that was. However, throughout all of these periods in the Old Testament, God would do nothing unless he first warned the people through the prophets that repentance was needed. Every time, every occasion, Israel or Judah rebelled, he would send a prophet of God. To warn the people. They didn't really listen. But he sent them anyway. Nevertheless no matter what these prophets said or did. The people would always revert to the fallen nature. And don't we always? You know. That's an ongoing battle. In each and every one of us. The old nature. And the new nature. And that's where we must overcome, brothers and sisters. We must let the new nature imparted to us by the Holy Spirit, the nature of Christ himself, that's birthed within each and every one of you, who truly know him. That must lead us through to victory over the old nature. But they would revert to their fallen nature and rebel against God. The reason is clear. Man can never change his ways by his own strength. We can try. You can try to quit smoking. 
in your own strength. Few may succeed, many don't. Alcoholism, drug addiction, gambling. Try and do it in your own strength and it's incredibly difficult, almost impossible in your own strength without the Lord as your stronghold. Man can never change his ways on his own strength. He would always need an advocate. And so do we. A substitute. And this is clearly what the whole of the Old Testament teaches us. The body of Christ. Our advocate is the Lord Jesus Christ. And glory to his name. It's why Jesus came into this world. He came so that a way may be made where there was no way before. If he or she wanted it. That's the catch. Do you want it? Do you need it? Do you need Jesus? Praise God. Now we have the new pattern. Yes, This is why Jesus came. We've had the pattern of the Old Testament shown to us in both Israel and Judah and what happened to them. You know, these things were written for our benefit, saints. They're not there as just stories and fables to read on a Sunday morning to the children. They're there for us to learn from so that we don't make those same mistakes. Jesus came to make a way back to the Father by offering up his own life as a spotless sacrifice to the Father to satisfy the wrath of Almighty God which was upon mankind for sin. However, Jesus didn't just make a way. He was and is the way. He's that straight and narrow way. Does that make more sense to you then? He is that straight and narrow way. He walked a narrow path in his life. And we are called to do likewise. He came to be a spotless sacrifice to the Father. By his life of total obedience to and faith in his Heavenly Father, Jesus was revealing himself as the new pattern. This was proved to be true by God raising him from the dead to newness of life forevermore. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad that Jesus rose from the dead? Praise God! Praise God! This was to be the pattern which the church, the body of Christ, you and I in this place today and those outside were to emulate. Just as the tabernacle was the pattern given to Moses for the people of Israel. So Jesus is the pattern given by God to us. Today. And we can learn all about him from God's word. So freely available to every single one of us. It's interesting that, to me anyway, it may not be to you, that in the chronologically final book of the Tanakh, the Old Testament that we would know, the chronological final book, not the order that it's in in your Bible, it's Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles is the chronologically final book of the Old Testament. And in its final verse, we have this. Two Chronicles, chapter 36, Verse 23. 2 Chronicles, chapter 36, verse 23. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia. Well, why am I quoting a king of Persia? Well, listen and you'll find out. All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me. And he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem which is in Judea, 
Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Do you know what those final words, go up, let him go up, are in the Hebrew? Aliyah. You know what Aliyah means? Yeah? Going up to Jerusalem. It's interesting because for those of you who didn't know, the final few words in English, as I've said, are Aliyah. Going up. Back to the truth. Back to where God is. And where's God now? In you, through Jesus Christ. So we need to go up to him regularly. This is the ultimate meaning, I believe, of Aliyah. Our going up to meet him in the air. The final gathering of the saints of God. The last Aliyah. Aren't you looking forward to that? Amen. Yeah. I know I am. I'm looking forward to a new body. <laughs> I can tell you. This is the ultimate meaning. It's going up to be with the Lord. To commune with Him. To live with Him forevermore. That's our promise. That's our goal. That's our hope. In Christ. So why wouldn't you prepare for it? Doesn't the word of God tell us that we're the bride of Christ? The marriage of the Lamb will take place where? In London? No, in heaven. When we've come up, when we've made the final aliyah. So then for us to be there, we must follow the pattern. Mustn't we? How much longer have I got, Pastor? Like five minutes? Yeah, that should be enough. We must follow the pattern that's been shown to us. The Bible, and especially for us the New Testament, shows what the results will be of failing to follow the pattern. We only have to read and consider seriously such parables as that of Matthew 25, 1 to 13, the wise and foolish virgins. It's a serious thing, brothers and sisters, to be left out on that day. We won't go into it now for sake of time, but read it in your own time again. Matthew 25, the first 13 verses. And I hope that you'll see and understand that it's not about going to sleep, because they were all asleep. All ten virgins were asleep. When the shout went up, the bridegroom is coming. The difference was, the five wise virgins had prepared. They prepared oil. And we know what the oil means. It's the presence and the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's being in that good relationship with the Lord. Good and close relationship. Communing backwards and forwards with the Lord. Through prayer, through his word. And the church as a whole, as it stands today, at least here in the West, is ill-prepared for this time, this coming time, the return of the King of Kings. The Great Commission was as, as follows. Matthew 28. Jesus came to them and he said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Matthew 28, 17-20. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Teach all nations. Baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. Even unto the end of the world. Can I get an amen? Amen. Praise God. We need to be persistent with him. We need to be persistent with him. It's my personal belief that the church in general in the West has lost this concrete belief and trust 
in the Lord God. Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. The Word tells us. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. We need faith. We need that concrete belief and trust in the Word of God that what He says, He is going to do. Do you believe it, saints? Yes. Hallelujah. Because it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not, He's going to do it. <coughs> but it's better for you if you believe it. The church is going through the motions. Just as was Israel and Judah prior to their captivity in either Assyria or Babylon. Many hundreds of thousands possibly went into captivity into Babylon alone. The numbers vary. But certainly over 100,000, maybe 200,000 went into captivity into Babylon. You know how many came out? 50,000. 50,000. The rest got used to the good life in Babylon. The freedom to set up shops and do their own thing. But 50,000, a remnant, a blessed remnant came back. And brothers and sisters, that remnant is you. In this day. You are the remnant or part of of the remnant of God. God will always have his remnant. He knows who he is. And as Paul wrote in Romans, Romans 11, verse 5, even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And as is repeated throughout the book of Revelation, there will be a remnant who endure to the end and will have overcome. Because it's written, Revelation 12, verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. And what? The word of their testimony. You have a testimony. We need to use it. That's our sword, along with the word of God. That's the living word of God in us. That's our testimony. Let me ask a question as we, as we close this first message. Could this speak of you, this last verse, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their life unto death. Could this message speak of you or I at this present time? Think about it. We don't know how much longer the Lord will tarry. We don't know how long we have individually. God could take me tonight. Am I ready? Are you ready? We need to be prepared, brothers and sisters. And in the next message, we're going to examine, as I've said, how we can be better prepared for when the Lord does return. Or indeed, if we're called home before that takes place. May God bless you. Amen.